there's nothing around, just the eternal, endless whiteness of Greenland's snow and cold winds blowing into your face. Nothing hints at the impending catastrophe. You take another step and freeze in horror. An abyss is spreading at your feet, bottomless and dark. If you had made a bigger step, it would have swallowed you. That infamous Greenland's Hole. It happened in the middle of the 2010s. A group of geologists were scanning the surface of Greenland's Hiawatha Glacier using radar when they spotted something very, very strange. It was a giant pit, more than 980 feet deep and almost 20 miles wide. That's big enough to fit inside Washington, D.C. or Paris. After staring at their radars for quite a while and scratching their heads, hmm. researchers decided to find out what could have made such a huge hole. Could it have been good old erosion? A raging volcano? An asteroid impact? A giant sandworm? Ugh, I might have gone a bit overboard hmm. with this worm idea, hmm. but you never know with these ancient glaciers. Anyway, in our case, one mystery seemed to lead to another, which had been puzzling scientists for decades. And to solve both of them, Scientists needed something super common, but at the same time very important. Quartz, one of the most abundant materials in Earth's crust. But before we dig deeper into this topic, let's make a small detour and talk about a pretty bizarre phenomenon called the Younger Dryas Event. To see what it was like, we need to go deep into the past. As far back as 12,900 to 11,600 years ago. During that period, the planet became much colder, especially in Europe and North America. Now, let's talk a bit more about that weird climate change in the Northern Hemisphere. There are a few theories, one that involves a change in currents in the Atlantic Ocean. Another speaks about something large kicking tons of dust into the air and effectively blocking sunlight. The two most popular and likely hypotheses mention a volcanic eruption and an asteroid impact. Indeed, there was a volcanic eruption on the territory of modern-day Germany at around the right time. But there's also a probability that a space object struck the planet during this period too. And now let's get back to the hole scientists found in Greenland. When NASA's Ice Bridge program and Germany's Alfred Wegener Institute discovered it, it seemed they had finally found the reason for the Younger Dryas event. But was it really an asteroid that created that impressive pit and caused temperatures to drop all over the Northern Hemisphere? To test this theory, the researchers needed quartz. The thing is, in its pure form, quartz has a very simple structure. It's made from interlocking silicon oxygen tetrahedra. Efficient and so pretty. Just look at these six-sided prismatic crystals. Since its structure is so simple and the components are so common, you can find quartz almost in any rock on the planet. At one point, magic happens. Larger rocks erode away, pushing out tiny bits of quartz sand. The scientists exploring the mysterious pit gathered the quartz sand that had been washed out from underneath a glacier. It was like looking at the rocks at the very bottom of the hole without having to actually get all the way down there. Very handy. So, while examining the material, they discovered quartz grains with the telltale signs of terrible catastrophe. They had PDFs all over them. Uh, no, I'm not hmm. talking about the document format. PDFs stand for Planar Deformation Features, and they look like lines etched into the crystal surface. These lines are a sign that you're holding shocked quartz. It forms under immense pressure when the internal crystals are pushed out of alignment. But the most exciting thing here is that shocked quartz only appears under the influence of powerful forces, like massive impacts or terrifying explosions. In other words, finding this poor shocked quartz under the Hiawatha Glacier could be much needed proof that the hole was an enormous impact crater that formed when something equally enormous crash landed there. Based on the size of the crater, this space object probably was a bit more than a mile across, which is twice the height of the Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai. A meteorite that big would have looked three times as bright as the sun when traveling across the sky, and it would have hit Earth with an immense force. 
The impact would have been so great, it'd have vaporized rock and thrown debris for hundreds of miles away. The sky would have filled with dust. It would have dimmed the sun and led to a temperature drop all over the planet. And guess what? The last part about decreasing temperatures got the researchers super excited. Because it opened up a possibility that the impact could have been connected to the Younger Dryas event. To prove this idea, scientists decided to use quartz again. They examined it more closely, trying to date the impact. Well, they were in for an even greater shock. The Hiawatha crater turned out to be not 12,000, but 58 million years old. On the other hand, the researchers were disappointed that they hadn't been able to confirm their theory. The crater couldn't explain the Younger Dryas cold snap. But on the other hand, it was still an amazing discovery. Now, get ready for one final twist to this story. And it revolves around quartz again. Other scientists have recently discovered more deposits of shocked quartz all over what is now the eastern USA. It was hiding in sediment layers dating to just before the Younger Dryas. Interestingly, there aren't any craters around those sites whatsoever. But quartz can't lie. It provides evidence of a powerful explosion. It makes scientists think that their impact hypothesis might still be true. But instead of a collision, it could be an airburst. A massive comet could have broken up while entering Earth's atmosphere around 12,000 years ago and the fragments could have exploded before reaching the ground. It would have caused catastrophic mass burning throughout the North American continent and messed with the climate so much that the Younger Dryas would have been triggered. Well, I guess we need to wait a bit longer for scientists to find some further proof of this hypothesis. But it doesn't mean we don't have any more curious phenomena to explore in Greenland. Take these fascinating holes. They sure are kinda smaller than the monster we were talking about. They're called moulins, and they carry surface meltwater all the way down to the base of the Greenland ice sheet. And they have prepared some surprises for us, too. Apparently, they're way larger than we previously thought. That's what a recent study based on observation and first-hand exploration claims. Even more interesting. This high volume might influence the stability of the ginormous ice sheet in question, as well as the speed at which it's sliding towards the sea. Researchers think that increased water depth and pressure inside moulins might lubricate the base of the ice sheet, making it move faster. You know, the way an ice cube slides more easily on a thin film of melted water. Until recently, we knew too little about the real size of moulins and how much water they can hold. But now, we know that moulins can be giant. The team made two trips to the Greenland ice sheet in 2018 and 2019. And during each of them, they used ropes and climbing equipment to drop around 330 feet into two separate moulins, almost touching the water's surface. Those who did it described the experience as intimidating. Picture this. Your back is over the edge. All you see is bluish ice going down and blurring into blackness. And the only thing you hear is occasional sounds of crashing ice. It must be extremely unnerving. The floor is lava! Haha, <laughs> just kidding. But honestly, it's kind of falling apart. You might not feel it yet, but a huge part of North America has already lost 37 miles worth of rock from its foundation. And no, this isn't about earthquakes or giant sinkholes. It's about the continent losing pieces of the very thing that keeps the ground from wobbling around like a bad carnival ride. A team of researchers has just dropped a geological bombshell. Part of North America's ground is thinning out like a very sad, very slow ice cream drip. How do they know? They basically gave Earth a high-tech full-body MRI and created 3D maps showing how rocks once considered indestructible are now melting away into the planet's guts, like an upside-down cheese pizza inside an oven. But to really understand this mess, you first have to meet my old friends, cratons. Cratons are like the roots of the continents. They're thick, tough, and ancient. We're talking billions of years old. These bad boys survived meteor impacts, supervolcanoes, 
and even the tectonic movement of plates. If the plates got into fistfights, for example, you can bet we would see mountain ranges being born. If they got a divorce, drifting apart from each other, then a whole new ocean would be born. All of these things leave scars on the surface of Earth, but the cratons seem to always remain unfazed, like the cockroaches of geology. And since a craton can basically get punched in the face and feel nothing, scientists always assumed these things were nearly indestructible. But then, a group of researchers took their fancy machines to the test and realized that, wait, the cratons are falling apart? How? Enter the Farallon Plate, a really ancient tectonic plate that started to slide under North America's major plate over 100 million years ago. This is a pretty normal process, actually. It's called subduction, and it's how Earth recycles rocks and keeps itself from overheating. This subduction thing has been happening for so long that, by now, the Farallon is almost 400 miles away from the Craton, sitting pretty chill at the lower mantle, weirdly close to the outer core of our planet. But the Farallon has been causing trouble, like that one roommate who moved out but keeps leaving weird stuff in the fridge. You see, as it sinks, it tugs on the bottom of North America's foundation, stretching it out and causing pieces to fall off into the deep mantle. And if that wasn't enough drama, the sinking Farallon has also leaked water and carbon dioxide into the surrounding rocks, making the craton even softer and easier to shred apart. Thanks, Farallon. Very cool of you. By studying hundreds of earthquakes across thousands of monitoring stations, scientists have confirmed the story. Big chunks of continental material are dripping downward, thinning the craton by as much as 37 miles. That's more missing rocks than can fit into a milk carton. Sounds dramatic, right? But don't worry. This is happening at a snail's pace. It'll take millions of years for anything noticeable to happen. Your great-great-great-great few grandkids from the distant future might still be standing on solid ground. But don't get too comfy. This thing may not be an urgent problem, but there's another type of sinking that's happening faster than you can say, help. Here's the thing. By 2050, at least 32 major cities in the US, including New York, Baltimore, and Charleston, could be partially underwater. And guess what? This one is mostly our fault. Scientists noticed that since 2007, some cities have been sinking into the ground between 0.04 and 0.08 inches every year. Charleston, in South Carolina, is pulling ahead in the worst way possible, sinking 0.15 inches annually. Sure, these numbers sound tiny and a bit ridiculous, but Charleston is barely 9 feet above sea level, and a little sinking goes a long way when the ocean is breathing down your neck. On really bad flood days, people there have to abandon their cars and basically swim home. This whole phenomenon is called land subsidence, and when you mix sinking land with rising sea levels, you get a disaster cocktail of flooded streets, salty farmland, ghost forests, and a lot of very cranky homeowners. And it doesn't stop with just homes. Infrastructure like bridges, roads, airports, and power plants all things we rely on daily are also at risk of serious damage. Flooded electrical grids and sunken highways could cause billions more in economic losses and create major safety hazards for communities. Now, let's be fair. Not everything is humanity's fault. Some of this trouble dates all the way back to the Ice Age. About 12,000 years ago, massive ice sheets covered the northern US. They were heavy, like seriously heavy. The weight pushed the land down, and when the ice melted, the ground didn't just pop back up like a trampoline. Instead, it started playing a weird game of geological seesaw. The places that were squished started rising, and the places that weren't got pulled down. This whole process, called glacial isostatic adjustment, try to say that three times fast. But of course, humans found a way to make it worse. Groundwater extraction is a major culprit. Think of it like pulling the stuff out of the mattress. After a while, the whole thing just sags. In places like California's Central Valley, the land is dropping by up to 8 inches a year because we keep pumping out water during droughts. 
In cities like New York, the problem isn't just water. Skyscrapers themselves are making it worse. Yep, turns out if you stack millions of tons of concrete and steel onto soft ground, it tends to flatten. And in case you're wondering, the total mass of New York City's buildings is around 1.68 trillion pounds. That's about the same as 3.5 million Statues of Liberty piled up. With so much weight concentrated over a relatively small area, the underlying soils have no choice but to compress over time. And if you thought it couldn't get messier, think again. We've been building dams, which stop rivers from delivering fresh sediment to coastal areas. That sediment is kind of like Mother Nature's way of fluffing the ground back up. Without it, coastal lands are compacting like an old sponge. Plus, when wetlands are drained for agriculture or construction, the peaty soil dries out and collapses. Honestly, it's like the ground just can't catch a break. Scientists also noticed that the areas that used to be lush wetlands are now among the fastest sinking spots in the country, especially along the Gulf Coast. Louisiana, for example, is losing about a football field of land because of this mix of subsidence and rising seas. So what's the end game here for us regular people who just want to live above sea level? Well, it's not looking great. Ghost forests, which are basically drowned woodlands, are popping up. Farmland is turning salty and unusable. And even sunny day flooding, where streets flood without any rain, is becoming a thing. Yikes! Meanwhile, over on the West Coast, California is not exactly winning either. San Francisco and Los Angeles are both sinking, which means that rising sea levels could hit them twice as hard and twice as fast. In some places, like the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the ground has been sinking so fast, people over there might as well live like moles. So, is America turning into the next Atlantis? Probably not next week, but without serious action, like cutting back on groundwater pumping and planning smarter cities, at least 500,000 people are in serious danger. And the housing damage could easily rack up a jaw-dropping $109 billion by 2050. In the end, while North America isn't about to sink like a poorly made souffle, it's definitely showing some cracks in the crust. So maybe let's ease up on groundwater pumping, rethink how and where we build, and invest a little more in keeping our feet dry. After all, if the floor really does become lava someday, we're gonna wish we had at least fixed the leaks first. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.